You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get to this week's episode with a former Navy member who has founded an organization that specifically deals with women and uh, PTSD as well as military sexual trauma. We'll get to that coming up in just a moment. But just a few of our normal announcements. Please follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground Podcast. Of course, Know where our website is, uh, hazardground.com. You can watch all of our episodes there and listen to all of our episodes there as well. And that is where you'll find our Amazon promotion right there on our homepage. Uh, Under the Sponsors tab or at the bottom of the homepage, you'll see an Amazon button. Click it. It'll redirect your rate to Amazon. You can do all of your normal Amazon shopping. We will get a percentage of what you guys spend, and then we'll donate a percentage of that back to some of the charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the show. So it's a great and easy way for you guys to help out military veterans everywhere. It's also great from your smartphone. Go to hazardground.com there, redirects it to the Amazon app. Super convenient, super easy. All your information is saved. So uh, again, an easy way to help out veterans across America. Subscribe to our YouTube channel because uh, you can watch our episodes there and download the Kill Cliff TV app. Of course, our partners at Kill Cliff here uh, helping us put on this show. The Kill Cliff TV app has all of our shows and go to killcliff.com for all of your clean energy drinks. Uh, some of the best products out there and proceeds from Kill Cliff go to benefit the Navy SEAL Foundation. Again, killcliff.com for all your clean energy drinks. Uh, that brings us to this week's guest, um, who sort of is a uh, is related to our guest from a few weeks ago, Lucy Delgado, Delgado, who told her amazing story about what she went through in the military. But this is a former member of the Navy, spent eight years there, got out as an E-4 corpsman, uh, and then went on to found and become the CEO of an organization called the Pink Berets, which is dedicated to helping women with post-traumatic stress disorder, specifically military sexual trauma. She is Stephanie Gatas joining us here on the Hazard Ground podcast. Stephanie, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you, Mark. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, and and for a little background for those who are listening and watching, it's a long time coming. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. <laughs> you, are, you are quite a busy woman, so we've tried for a while to get you on, and I'm so glad we get to hear your story again. Uh, Lucy was fantastic, um, and I know you guys work very close together, but uh, she was incredible, incredibly brave and just very open and candid about her story. So uh, it's amazing that you have somebody like that working with the Pink Berets and your organization. But uh, this show is about you and your start in the Navy. So how and when and why uh, did you end up there? Great question. Um, so really, I believe that it was something that um, wasn't well thought through in terms of why I decided to go in, right? It wasn't this process where, you know, I, I thought about the military in a number of different ways. I really thought, okay, I know I want to um, leave my my home base. I know I wanted to move on. I know there was a number of things that I wanted to accomplish. And so I just remember receiving this postcard in the mail about the Navy. And um, and I decided that I would look into it. And it so ended up happening that I, I joined the Navy. And it really happened very quickly. That's why I'm saying there wasn't really a whole lot of thought put into it. Um, I did have two grandparents who served in the military. Um, one grandfather served in the United States Navy, and um, my paternal grandfather served in the Army and is a um, Purple Heart recipient. So, you know, we have some some background in terms of the military. But, um, yeah, I just, I just felt at that time that it was a good option for me. What year was this that you signed up? 1994. Okay. So, uh, obviously, this is a pre-9-11 world. Uh, things yeah. are vastly different. Um, it's... In that world, you signed up for the military because you didn't have options or you were avoiding jail or whatever it may be. I mean, that was sort of – I mean, we chuckle, but that really was the narrative. Um, sure. Back in a pre-9-11 world, and the military was downsizing, or the active force was, and, and it just didn't seem like a viable future if you had one. Right. No, and that is a great question, and I still think there's still a stigma associated to why people join the military – and for me, I really just wanted, at that time, especially in my youth, I wanted to broaden my horizons. And I knew that I didn't want to stay home. So 
for me, the best option was, was to leave. And this was the best way to really just, you know, no pun intended, jump ship <laughs> and, <laughs> and move on to another one. So, um, so yeah, no, definitely not avoiding jail. I, I think that I was very meek moving into the military environment. So definitely very different, nothing that I would have ever expected. But, um, but I think it definitely shaped me into the person I am today. There's no question. All right. So from that standpoint, did you have any idea what to expect when you got in the Navy? I really did not. I can tell you that I, it was truly a shock to my system. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a, a strict family environment. I had two older brothers who were extremely protective. So, you know, moving into the military environment was very different. Um, and I had to adapt very quickly. But I also shifted into an environment where they had not yet acclimated in terms of bringing men and women together. So when I was sent overseas, I was put into a um, subtender. It was the USS Simon Lake. And they let me know that they were just starting to integrate women with the men. Oh, wow. So it was definitely a very um, different environment because the men weren't used to the women being there. The women weren't used to having to be subjected to what the men thought of us being there. So there was, I, I want to say in, in the very beginning stages, it was, it was pretty um, challenging. You know, it, for me, I was dealing with a number of different personalities from all over the world. And so um, you had to adapt and you had to adapt quickly. Your first couple of weeks, did you think you had made a bad decision, whether it was boot camp or when you got to, I mean, did you go to the fleet at that point or when you got to your ship? Did you think you had made a bad decision? I want to say uh, yes. I thought, what the hell have I gotten myself into? Like, this is not at all what I had envisioned. And, and that might be the case for a number of people, right? We see the commercials. We get the postcard. We hear stories from our recruiter. And it's their job to really amp up what it is you're going to do in the military. But, you know, there's no question that for me, serving my country and being able to, to come in and, and partake in protecting our country was a big deal for me. But I can tell you that it was not at all what I had expected. No, I mean, it was, there's a lot of animosity. That's for certain. Um, you know, nobody was, I, I think everybody at that time was really trying to figure out how to work with one another. And in the midst of trying to understand how to work with one another, there was really just this back and forth pull on, you know, how women um, should be treated in the military or how women should be accommodated, especially when you're overseas. Um, you know, women were being sent back to the States once they learned that they were pregnant. I mean, there wasn't any facilities to accommodate any type of health care when it, when, when it pertained to women. So, I mean, I can, I can really kind of just focus on a number of different things that, that could have been better. But I fast forward now and we're still, we're still facing a lot of those challenges. But I can tell you, you know, as boots on the ground at that time, I saw it firsthand. I knew what that was like. Yeah, and I guess I'm wondering, you know, day to day life there. Um, did you begin to feel like you didn't belong or you didn't fit in? Um, in the beginning, yes, but I can tell you that I quickly learned that I had to be on the defense. And I had this conversation uh, not too long ago with Stacey Pearsall where you know, we had this really in-depth ah, conversation. Former, former previous guest on the Hazard Ground podcast. Oh, my God. She's amazing. Yes. She's, yeah, I, I, def I look up to Stacey. She is an amazing and accomplished uh, woman. So, um, you know, we, we had this, this similar conversation where I told her, you know, you're going alongside your brothers in arms and your sisters in arms and your expectation is that you're going to, you're going to move forward together. You're going to fight together. You're going to protect together. Um, but I said, oftentimes I felt like we were defending ourselves from one another. You know, um, I became very combative. I mean, I had a, I felt like I entered into situations that I should not have entered into, um, not by choice. Um, I felt that there was a real thought process instilled in you very quickly that it was a um, survive, 
survival of the fittest, I, I guess, is the best way I can describe it. Um, if you can't survive being there, you are going to be sent back. If you can't survive being there, you're going to be kicked out. So it's almost like you were fighting to prove that you were worthy or that you should be there. And this was your military, too. Was there an internal struggle for you in that fighting to prove that you belong there, to do it, to prove to yourself that you belong there, or just to prove to the guys that were there who didn't think you belonged there? Like, I mean, or, or is there a difference between the two? Well, there's definitely a difference. I, I can understand what, what it is that, that you're asking. And I can tell you that it was both. Um, I did struggle internally, emotionally, mentally, um, not so much physically, right? Because I was definitely a lot younger then, um, but also to prove yourself. But I found that I had to talk to them the way that I was being spoken to. So if it was you know, get your fucking ass up on deck and get shit done, then it would maybe, I would respond with, well, when you ask me the right way to get out there and do what I got to get done, I'll do it. Otherwise, um, I'm not moving. And it, it was just constant, it, this, this thing where it was an alpha <laughs> world. Um, you had to really find your place. And if you didn't find your place, then they were going to make sure that you were a target. And so I had to really show my my strength. Um, and that wasn't easy. That wasn't easy at all. Um, I know at one point I was pulled to the side by my chief and he asked me to stop telling women to defend themselves. And I told him, well, that's exactly what we need to be doing. If we don't defend ourselves, they're going to they're going to stand around crying and they're going to be a target. And I'm only telling them not to allow themselves to be a target. Um, and that's what you felt like is constantly having to prove that as a woman, you belong in the military and you could work just as hard and you could serve your country um, just as much as they could. And so it was definitely a struggle within, but also, again, to be to prove you're you're a survivor and that you're somebody that can overcome. When you say protect yourself, did you mean physically, emotionally? Like what, what level of protection are we talking about? All of the above. And I say that because I was harassed. I was stalked. I was assaulted. And I can tell you that there was a time where I didn't feel like I always had to be on high alert. Because after things happen to you, you feel like you have to constantly be looking over your shoulder. You have to just learn ways to deal with what's happened to you. And back then, there wasn't really this huge understanding associated with being assaulted. Right. And I, I, would, I would learn of it happening to other women. So for me, it was like, is this the standard? Is this what we're supposed to be accustomed to? Is this is what we're supposed to face so there was there was a lot of struggles. Um, I know at one point I I um, entered a fight and I left my um, watch station. Um, I was supposed to be on duty and I left and I got into an altercation and then I ended up being locked up for thirty days. Well, then that ended up heightening my my experience because for me, again, it was always fight flight or freeze. And I was always in fight mode. That was the best way that I could describe it. So as you can imagine, you know, when things happen, some people respond differently to their traumas. And my response to my traumas was to fight. And, and so I think for me, that just made things worse. So I would excel because again, I was always trying to prove myself, but then I would get dropped in rank because I was combative and I was um, not assertive, but aggressive. And I think that when you're working so hard to prove and to survive and to thrive, I mean, all those things at some point come to a head sure. and it did for me. It did for when me. When you say a fight, I mean, you mean like a fist fight. Correct. You got, you got into it. Like, can you clarify just give me the, whatever you're comfortable with as far as the example is concerned, but like, what do you mean? How, did, how does this all go down? You, you left your watch to get into a fight or you left your watch to to uh, start a fight, find a fight? Like, help me out here. I left because I was told that there is a um, group of women who are planning on attacking one of um, my very close friends. 
And close friend, so male I, friend or close friend, female friend? Female friend, a close okay. female friend that was that I was serving with. And um, we weren't watch we weren't on watch at the same time. And the plan was that when she left the ship and she was gonna go out into town, everybody was going to go to the same place and she was going to be attacked. And so when somebody let me know this was going to take place, I decided that I was going to leave and make sure that didn't happen. And so for me, I showed up where they had planned on showing up and we all entered into a brawl. Wow. Who won? Well, I, I like to say that I did because <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I ended up being the one that they targeted and in, in, uh, ended up at captain's mass. So yeah, I was essentially the perpetrator, but really I was more the protector. For me, it was about, again, making sure that um, my sister wasn't attacked. Sure. And right. um, I don't know that I would have been okay with me knowing that something was going to happen. It should have something had happened. And I just stayed watching, you know, at, in, at my duty station. In retrospect, do you wish you had called someone and said, like, called your superior and said, hey, chief, this is going to go down. I've got information on this. Can we stop it somehow? Can I leave and go? Like, or is that just one of those in, you know, youthful piss and vinegar, I'm just going to handle this stuff myself? In, retros in retrospect, the Stephanie now would definitely do that. I mean, I, I think, you know, going into the military at, at a young age, um, there's a, a, a map, vast amount of immaturity. And I can tell you, definitely didn't think through it. It was really just a reaction to what I had learned. Uh, but in hindsight, yeah, I would have definitely said, OK, there's a better way to handle this and there's a better way to make sure that this could be addressed um, because I got in, into a lot of trouble for that. And, you know, thankfully, I still discharged from the military honorably. But, um, you know, I, I wish I didn't have that stain on my record that reflected, you know, that uh -huh. I, I, wonder I got in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, I wonder, you know, the just on the surface level, the concept of fitting in and proving them wrong uh, and proving to yourself that you could do it. On one hand, some of those actions seem counter to that, right? Like there, there, right. if you wanted to fit in and you wanted to show people that you belonged, well, bucking trends and leaving, ma leaving your watch and doing all this other stuff is the behavior that some would consider counter to trying to belong and fit in to the way the military wants you to and the Navy wants you to. Did you ever have to right. reconcile those differences or did you, did it come later on in life that you did? I feel like it came later in life. I really do. Um, and I think that that's why I really work to help people understand, you know, what it, they could possibly be subjected to and that there are ways to address it and there are ways to prepare yourself for it. I wish that I was more prepared going into it, but again, I was more reactive than proactive in terms of really preparing myself for what's to come. Right? I had nobody to really thoroughly explain what it is that I would be faced with. You know, what does the military environment look like? Um, without kind of that basic information that they give you firsthand, um, I don't think that I, I was as prepared. So I think today we do a much better job of preparing people when they're entering the military. But there's also a number of things that we have to fix in the military system. So, you know, there's there's so much yeah. that you could prepare people for now versus then. And then you also have social media. I mean, think we didn't have social media no. then. In some cases, really thank God, right? Age, but <laughs> <laughs> in some cases, thank God. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you had mentioned earlier that you had been assaulted. Uh, I assume you didn't report this to your supervisors? Um, I reported the individual prior to being assaulted. And, um, For what? I had, went, I had went to the military police um, because I was being followed everywhere. Okay. And I noticed that I was being followed. By and the so, individual? Or just you noticed you were being followed in general? I noticed I was being followed in general. Okay. Um, and so for me, I thought, okay, um, at one point I stopped and I told this individual, um, mm -hmm. to stop following me. And I became very aggressive in terms of, you know, I was spewing all these, all these derogatory words. I was cussing at him and telling him, you know, that he needed to leave me alone. And so, um, 
when that wasn't happening, I went to the military police and I explained to them, like, listen, I'm comfortable, you know, leaving here at night and then noticing that I'm being followed by the same person. And I said, in this last time that I asked for him to leave me alone and to stop following me, his words were, I just want to make sure that you're okay. And so, you know, listen, this wasn't someone I hung out with. This wasn't someone I was friends with. You know, we just happened to be serving in the same place. Um, so it became extremely uncomfortable. Um, the other thing that, you know, women take responsibility when things like this happen. And I say take responsibility in that when I was assaulted, I had been drinking. Um, and it was a classic case of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. We had a lot of house parties. There was a, a number of, of ways that we tried to just really forget about where we were and what we were doing. And so to wake up and find that somebody was on top of you is not the way that you were expected to be treated. And it's not, especially not in the military, right? Because again, you're not supposed to defend yourself against one another. Um, you're supposed to defend your country from the enemy. And so this for me was a wake up call. It was a big wake up call. When you look back um, on the assault, do, do you, well, knowing you can't prevent it, obviously, you know, before it happens, but right. are, are there moments throughout the whole ordeal where you start to think and feel, if I had just done this different, I might have gotten different results. If I had just not gone to this place, whatever it was, when you look back on it, is there any of that for you? There's definitely um, regret. Um, and I wish I had not drank as much as I did. Right. And then when I look back and reflect, and, and I still do to this day, I mean, it's not something you forget. Um, but I do think it shapes you to the person that you are. And I do think that it makes you a stronger individual. Um, but I can tell you that, yeah, I, I, I definitely have regrets. I have regrets in how I handled things. I have regrets in that um, the way that I thought I should address, uh, the way that I felt was to drink it away, to drink my problems away, to drink my thoughts away, to drink my feelings away, <laughs> right? So um, I just wish I would have been stronger in that sense and not succumb right. to drinking as much as I did. You, you had mentioned that you had reported them before the assault. Did you, did you try to go through military channels after it had happened? Yes, I went back to the military police and I had explained what had happened. Um, the problem was there wasn't anything that was taken very seriously because then after that, he was allowed to still be in the same space. He was still allowed to communicate with me. Um, at one point, he asked, why did I tell <laughs> and I distinctly remember thinking, is he serious? Is this really happening? You know, is this my life? Um, so I felt at that time, it was kind of like, well, you know, you said you were drinking, maybe don't drink. Um, and so it was never a, listen, we've heard a number of stories. We've heard this keeps happening. We're going to address it. We're going to make sure something changes. We're going to hold him accountable. And the thing is, he wasn't held accountable. It was basically a slap on the hat. And I kept telling them, well, if it happens to me, how do we know it's not happening to anybody else? Right. Right. So was there a um, um, was th not that I get the sense that you had ever really trusted the Navy before this, but was there a more of a broken sense of trust after it? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. My trust was severed in a number of ways. I mean, even after the military, I, my trust was just severed. I, I just always felt that people didn't have the best of intentions because the people that I thought had um, good intentions didn't. Um, and then, like I said, like epic level of harassment. And some people thought that that was just normal, that that's that's the military, man. You know, like you're in the military. They're going to they're going to poke and prod. Um, I distinctly remember saying, well, listen, you wanted to enter a man's world. You wanted to enter a man's military world. This is what you can expect. And, um, you know, of course, you know, I always had a, a rebuttal. 
Um, but for me, at the end of the day, it was just okay. You know, this is happening. There's nothing I can do. I'm not being protected. Nobody really listens. Didn't feel like anybody cared. And it wasn't me as this weak woman who was crying or complaining. It was just raising the flag on the things that were happening. Um, and think this was back in the late 90s by that time. So there was a lot of just misconceptions. Um, again, people just went rogue in terms of behavior. It was, you know, we're just going to do whatever we want when we want. Um, I witnessed, I just, you know, I, when I think back to that time period, you know, I witnessed so many catastrophic things that it just made you wonder what you had entered yourself into. But then I know that's not the same for everybody. So that's right. why for me, it's, you know, I don't, I don't shame the Navy. I don't shame the military. I think they, it shaped me definitely into the woman I am today. But what I do call out is the kind of people that enter, the kind of people that are allowed to enter. Um, you know, the military can't continue coming under scrutiny when really you have to evaluate who is allowed to enter the military to protect our country. And are they protecting others alongside them in the process? Um, so, yeah, I can tell you that, you know, if there's a number of things I could have done differently. Most certainly there's there's so much that I wish I could have done differently. But again, if I hadn't had those experiences, um, good and bad. I would not be the person I am today. I would not do the work that I do. I would not make it my life's work to ensure that laws change or that um, certain benefits are applied for women that have been traumatized. Um, and men too. It doesn't just happen to women. It happens to men. So for me, it's, it's just become my life's work to ensure that there's change and that the narrative changes as well and that we really expose those that should be following the rules uh, as it applies to the military um, and that we should ensure that people are protected while serving. It can't be just, listen, you know, you're serving your country, you're protecting your country, but what are you doing to protect me? What are you, do what are you doing to protect me so that in the process, I'm being the best person that I can be to serve my country. I'm doing the best that I can do and I'm excelling uh, and I'm thriving in, in a military environment. Um, and obviously I'm here. I proved that, that I could make it. Right. Uh, but it didn't come without consequence. Was that the, uh, was that the only time you were assaulted while you were in the Navy? Um, <sighs> when I went into reserves, I had another experience, um, it took me years to talk about the things that had happened just because I, I had prided myself on being somebody who would always be watchful because of an experience that I had. Sure. Um, in this particular experience, I was in North Carolina and I was working at Camp Lejeune. And um, I just distinctly remember... Um, telling a friend of mine that we had to leave because I was feeling really dizzy and I had had just one drink. It wasn't, I wasn't someone who was just like, yeah, let's balls to the wall. Let's make a night of it. We're going to drink all night. Um, I just distinctly remember saying, listen, I've only taken maybe a few sips and I'm, I feel like I'm going to pass out. Um, so for me, it just reminded me of everything that I had experienced before, just because this time it was different. This time yeah. my drink was laced. Um, once they picked up my drink and they looked at the bottom of it, it had these white granules. And so she was like, we've, we've got to go. Um, I can tell you that what you feel like on the inside is that you've let yourself down that you weren't um i guess what's the best way to describe it you know you're supposed to be this person of strength 
and you let your guard down. Right. And when you let your guard down, you get assaulted. And the reason I took responsibility was because I didn't protect myself the way that I should have. Um, and that is something that's really hard to contend with because those are things that play over in your mind. When you talk about things that you regret, you know, I regret going to that party. I regret drinking as much as I did. I regret trusting the people around me. You know, it's full of regrets. But then on the other hand, I think, okay, I've reflected on the things that I could have done better, but what can I do now to make sure that someone like myself has a better outcome. Someone like myself un understands, listen, it's okay to drink, it's okay to have fun, but make sure you have your battle buddy with you or make sure that you allow yourself you know, certain parameters so that you do get back home safe or you do get back to your, your destination safely. Um, there's so many things that I feel I've learned from the experience aside from the trauma that I can teach to others. And I, I really think that that's why things happen the way that they do, so that we can use our voice and share the experience, again, good or bad, and allow people to understand that there's life afterwards and that um, we're all resilient in our own ways. Um, you know, I akin it to saying, you know, this is veterans rising, right? This is veterans that have overcome what's happened and didn't allow it to define them. And I think that that's where I'm at today is that I did not allow it to define me. I didn't allow my trauma to allow me to decide what my life would look like. Right. Right. I had to decide that. And so for the pink berets, I think a lot of what we do and what we strive to do is really because of a reflection of what happened to us in our youth and saying, listen, you know, we get it, we understand it, but these are the tools that we're providing so that you can move forward. There's always a way forward um, because we want to also remove that victim mentality because that's another thing that we strive to do is to say, listen, I don't, I'm, I'm not here to play victim. I'm just here to say, listen, there needs to be some repercussions. There needs to be something that comes from, what happened um there's women with stories worse than mine mark and i can tell you that um you know there's an indifference and what we have found ourselves doing this entire time is fighting for that change and that's a lot sure. of what we do within the pink berets so i, I want to get to that in a moment but you mentioned the second time you were in the reserve so when did you leave the active navy i left in 98 okay and then so, you, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, how many more years in the reserves did you do after that? I did four more. No, two more. Okay. Two more collectively. All right. So, yeah, and it's an interesting time, right? Um, yes. Because military sexual assaults are on the rise at that point in time. Um, that was my active duty time as well. Uh, and it's weird. I, I never heard anything about it. Uh, while I was on active duty. I heard more about it when I left active duty and went to the guard than I did um, on active duty. But how quickly after you leave the military altogether, you leave the Navy altogether, do you come up with the idea for the Pink Berets and, and what does that look like? Did you have a plan after you had gotten out to do anything like that or are you just kind of working? No. Um, as a matter of fact, it took me a while to recognize that I was struggling with post-traumatic stress. Um, it took me time to realize that there was a lot of suffering going on that I was not dealing with. I just kept going through life thinking, no, I got this, I can take care of this. No, I'm fine, no, I'm okay. But um, there was something that my mom had said to me, and I've shared this on, on more than one occasion, that was kind of a wake-up call for me. Um, was the military didn't send my daughter back home. They sent me the devil. And she didn't want me around for a while. She said I was extremely aggressive. Um, I really got angry too quickly. Um, I was just always, uh, again, on the defense. I was always ready to fight. 
Um, you can look at me the wrong way. You can say the wrong thing. Um, I would just react um, in a way that wasn't normal. Yeah. And I think that when I came to the realization that I was in a downward spiral was when I recognized I needed to get help. Um, I had used a VA to get my home. I lost my home. Um, I would get a really good job, but then I'd lose my job. I mean, it was just this vicious cycle of not being able to um, find a sense of normalcy. You know, I was just, I would have a number of highs and lows. It'd be like, hey, I'm doing really great. And then I would plummet. And then I'd be doing really great. And then I would plummet. And it was one of those things where, yes, I would, I would fall face down, but then I would work hard to get myself back up. So I knew it was still in me to fight, to find that sense of normalcy and not fight physically, but to fight for me for once. Um, and that's when I recognized years later, years later, that something needed to change in me because I felt defeated. There was nothing was changing. And when was it going to change? And when was I going to get help? Because if I didn't get help, it was just going to be, again, a vicious cycle. I, I was never going to be um, somebody who at that time I felt was fit for society. And thank you by the grace of God that I didn't go to jail. <laughs> um, but I mean, I had I had a couple of close calls. And, you know, I don't mind sharing these things. I'm not proud of them. But. I also see how far I've come in terms of change because I did receive help. But again, you know, think about, you know, where I was in the military and how I responded there. And now think of me as a civilian. And, you know, I distinctly remember um, going out with some friends and afterwards this girl um, mouthing off to me about something. And um, I remember going back to my vehicle and, grabbing a blade and getting out of my vehicle and going back towards her was she ran into her car and she locked herself in it, her and her friends and called the police. And I thought like, wow, this is where I'm at right now. Like, who am I? Like I was, I was going to commit a crime and for what? Because I refused to get help because I was prideful because I, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking at that time. But I tell you this just I to do. show. You were thinking, I will, I will cut you. That, that's, yeah. what I was, <laughs> that's what you were thinking at that moment. I will cut you. Oh, my you. goodness. But it, again, there's, there's this thing where, it, it, again, you have an epiphany. That's what I tell people. You know, there's this wake-up call that um, happens. And my wake-up call happened. And it was like, I feel so defeated and I need help. I need help. Um, I remember researching what is out there for veterans like myself. And I kept coming across programs that were specifically for men. Right. And rightfully, right? Because they make up the larger percentage of the military. So for me, it was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. But what about for women like me, right? That have been through the things that I've been through. Think about it, too, then. In 2015, there wasn't really much out there for women. There wasn't a conversation centered around oh, PTSD I mean, and women. We, we were still having a bad conversation about how to deal with sexual assault in the military at that point in time. We were still having the wrong conversation back then. Yes, yes. But I also remember bringing up a conversation about military sexual trauma, and it was like the elephant in the room. People became uncomfortable. They didn't want to talk about it. Mm, no, not ready for that. Too much too soon. It's like, well, no, we need to talk about it. And this is why. And I remember repeatedly sharing um, the reasons why this organization needed to come to fruition and getting pushback. You know, I had some people say, oh, that's never going to go over well with people. I don't know that people are going to support this. Good luck. I mean, an all women's organization focused on women and PTSD. Yeah, no, I don't think it's going to happen. And so for me, it was like, OK. Challenge accepted, right? Like, sure. I'm going to do this regardless, because I know that if I can get help. Then I can build something where other women can get help, other women that have a similar situation or other women that have um, 
been in a downward spiral, who haven't dealt with their trauma, who are looking for various ways to do it. And um, I knew that I didn't want to seek any kind of medication. I knew that I wanted to um, do this with the non-medicinal approach, hence the holistic sure. therapies. Mm -hmm. And so I just started building the programs little by little until I created something that I thought was good enough for women to come and receive the help that they needed. And really, I mean, if you think about it, I just became <laughs> a salesperson on why this could work and why this could be very meaningful for the women out there. And, um, and then I also thought, will it work? Will women find that this is something that they could use to receive help, you know, to, to mm -hmm. be on this, this journey to heal. And so, um, I did it in 2015, you know, I, I filed the name for the pink berets and I started building out the programming. And then in 2016, um, I filed for a 501 C three and, um, started launching the programs for, um, yeah, I want, I want to dive into it a little bit. I, I think it's very apt what your mom had said that they sent you back the double. Um, because it, it, we say it all the time on the show in relation to combat that anybody who goes to war, whether you got shot at or blown up or you did or you didn't, the person you were before that experience dies uh, and there is a, a new person that comes home. That experience changes you forever. And, and military sexual trauma is no different than that. Um, it is it is a life altering experience from which you can't undo the things that happen, um, and so I think it's a really apt description from your mom because to to a certain extent, when studying PTSD, at least from a military standpoint, whether it's combat related or uh, MST related, you're dealing with somebody who now has to redefine themselves from start to finish. And to your point. Everybody deals with that in a much different way. Uh, you chose to drink and, you know, cut up biatches when they uh, when they stepped in front of you. <laughs> uh, you know, there there are people like me who just kind of shut down, packed it all in, and left it there, and never bothered to unpack it for ten plus years. Um, you know, I, I I didn't cut anybody, but you know, the, the uh, I'm sorry, and I'm just messing with you. I apologize. Um, I know you are. I know you are. But uh, you know, I mean, again, it, it manifests itself in different ways for different people, and I think that's that's, you know, what's what's challenging about this is because there is no cookie cutter approach. There are no real, hey, you know, you're angry, so it must be this. No, it could be that I told my kid to do something six times in a row, and they still haven't listened to me yet, and I'm just being a normal parent <laughs> who wants to strangle my child. Um, you know, like there's, there's that aspect of it. So it, not everything manifests itself in the same way. And I think it's super important to recognize that. Yes. Yes. And you know, these stories aren't easy to tell. I mean, nobody sure. wants to say, Hey, this was my behavior. But then I think back at, okay, if I don't explain what can happen if you don't get help, how we understand the severity behind the trauma and what it could evolve into. And so, while these stories are difficult, you know, the reminders are difficult, the wow, I was a hot mess, um, it's difficult to share. I still think that sharing those stories, someone's going to listen and say, I can relate. I was there too. And I really want to see what it is that I need to do to help myself. So those stories, although we may not be proud of them, are really important because those stories will really help people identify what it is that they need to do to change their current situation, or perhaps they know someone that needs to change their current situation and they need to get help. Um, or maybe it, it, you know, helps them understand that someone else needs that kind of help too. So, um, you know, there's, there's relevance and what it is that, that we share. And I mean, and again, um, thank God that I, I never um, fell into, you know, actually doing something that would have, would have really altered your life <laughs> really altered yeah, yeah really altered my life when you think when you think about it so you know I, I feel like I'm I'm made for everything that I do today now when when you started the pink parades I, I know that you guys wanted to deal with PTSD but that was the intent specifically to deal with military sexual trauma and then open it up to combat female veterans or was it the other way around it was more combat focused at first and then the MST stuff came in after you know, it was really more so the PTSD. Um, MST was part of the equation being because of 
my experiences and some of the experiences that I was listening to, but I don't think we realized how important it was to address the MST until we started to see women cross our threshold and a vast majority of them were MST survivors. Um, so what we thought initially, okay, the PTSD, um, the t- traumatic brain injuries, that was something we wanted to address as well yeah. um, because that fell in line with, with the combat um, veterans. So MST just really ended up highlighting a number of things. So it's almost like, you know, somebody who has a disease and then of that disease, there's all these comorbidities. So we look at that the same way with PTSD. You know, you have PTSD. So, you know, you're going to have depression, you know, you're going to have anxiety. And inevitably, the women that have PTSD have been assaulted in some fashion or harassed, you know, whatever the case may be, everybody's story is different. But I just remember thinking, I was not expecting for it to be a mass problem, the way that it became, hence the work that we ended up doing um, in DC, right, in terms of advocacy. So it really just opened up our eyes as to really how big the issue was. I don't think we realized at that time exactly how big the issue was until the women that were coming through the organization um, shared that this is what it was they needed help with. When you start to realize um, that that's the case, that MST is sort of uh, an overpowering number of the PTSD that you guys are dealing with, and then you revert back to your own personal story, um, are, are you empathetic? Are you angry? Are you dismayed are you shocked like because to me it feels like and again I'm, I'm on the outside looking in obviously I've never been assaulted um, in that manner but it's one of those things that feels like I would be furious if I had women walking through my door and I worked for the pink berets and, and trying to help people with PTSD that that was the majority of what I was dealing with especially considering it had happened to you uh, they did not address it properly. The individual got a slap on the wrist and everything else. And it's like, well, I bet my bottom dollar that that guy, that somebody else who walks through these doors is encountered that guy at some point in their career. And that's why they're here. Yeah, that's correct. And yes, that's, it is, I tell people it's still difficult today to listen to the stories and to shoulder a lot of what you know. Um, because also think the women that report the stories to us that come to us for help. Um, it's really difficult because they still haven't reported it. We have women that say, um, listen, this happened to me and I'm just trying to work through it. I don't know how to work through it. I'm having triggers. You know, I need something to focus on. And so a lot of what we do, obviously, is for them to to be in the present, to focus on themselves and, and, and on healing. But when we hear the stories, Absolutely. It makes you angry. It makes you emotional sometimes as well in terms of, you know, what these women have been through. Um, You know, you have women that now have children as a result of being raped. And so um, for me, it just really helps you understand the issue was far more severe than you originally thought it was. Um, And then you think, Okay, I have become definitely much more empathetic, but it's like they say, if something doesn't change, it doesn't change. And so you you have to be proactive in terms of saying, okay, listen, we are getting a large number of women coming through this organization. And of that number, X percentage are MST survivors. And these MST survivors aren't walking through our doors saying, you know, hey, I want to report this person. It's been so many years, but, you know, I need help to understand what I could do. It's, listen, I just want to feel a sense of normalcy. You know, I want to be a better mom. I want to be a better wife. I want to be a better sister. I want to be a better partner. You know, whatever it means to them in their life, they're looking to be better. They're looking to thrive. They're looking to um, just live a life that they're authentically meant to live. Not, you know, we have some women that couldn't leave their home, 
you know, what kind of life is that? Um, we have women that didn't think that they could work because they felt like they just didn't belong in society. I knew what that was like. So when you hear these stories, you also have to act as that person that can say, listen, it does get better. And there is so much more that you can accomplish or you wouldn't be here. And you still have that fight in you. And I say, you know, these women are strong. If they weren't strong, if they didn't have that resilience that resided deep within them, then they would not have signed up to serve their country. Um, and I know that, that, you know, we've all heard this saying where we signed a blank check um, in the amount of our life, right? We knew what we were getting ourselves into and we knew that we were willing to die for our country. Um, but let's reverse that for a moment. Were those that we served with willing to die for us? So when you think about these people that have had the experiences that they've had, the work that we aim to do is to really help them refocus on becoming that person that they were before. Now, I know, much like you said before, you're not the same. That's true. But we're really trying to bring out that inner strength. We're really trying to make sure that these women understand that there is fight left in them and that there's so much that they can do. And a lot of what we ask is to pay it forward. That's why we don't you know, charge for any of our services. We remove the financial barrier for them to get help so that they get help. Um, we plan a lot of activities so that they're really able to focus on themselves and really work through the trauma. Um, but also to gain an understanding that there's women around them that have also had a similar experience, maybe not an exact experience, but a very similar experience that will allow them to understand that they have a support system. And a support system is, is huge within the Pink Berets as well. You know, to be able to say, listen, you could call me at three o'clock in the morning and I'm going to answer if that's what you need. Mm -hmm. Or if you need somebody to come sit alongside you, we're going to do that. Or if you don't think that that you can get through it anymore and you're having suicidal ideations, we're going to get you into a treatment center. You know, whatever it is that somebody needs, someone somehow in our organization has been there and understands. And, you know, you spoke to one of those um, individuals. Lucy is is powerful in her own right. And and she's one of those women in our on our team that has the ability to really help women understand that that they're here for a reason and that there's so much more. Um, that they can accomplish. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that whole thing uh, real quick and, and it just dovetails into MST, but you mentioned that whole idea of, oh, well, we all, you know, uh, wrote a check up to and including our lives to the U.S. government. Like, look, I'm, I'm as macho and manly as they come, I feel like, but that's machismo bullshit. Like, and, and, it, and, it's, yeah. and it's flawed thinking because that's just not our, it's archaic. It's not our military anymore. What I did sign, right. what we all did sign now is a contract that I will work my tail off for you and I will represent you honorably and do everything that is needed to do to fulfill yeah. the, the military and the army or whatever it is mission that's fighting win American wars. And that includes give my life. I will do all those things and you will care for me in return. We are yes. on a two sided contract. And the idea that everybody thinks this is a one way street still, it's not the military that it is anymore. It's just not a one way street. It was the military that ignored sexual assault for decades because, well, this is what you signed up for, right? Like, that's yeah. just, that's asinine. It's just not the military that we're in anymore. And anybody out there who wants to tell me it's woke or this, whatever. Like, I've been in this organization for almost a quarter century. I understand the inner workings of it at this point in time. That's bad thinking. You have refused to change yeah. with the times that are in front of you. Uh, and, and, and a force that isn't willing to adapt and leaders that aren't willing to adapt to the scenery in front of them ultimately are going to be the ones that are going to be General Custer walking into oncoming gunfire. Like, that's just the reality of the situation. Um, there, there is no other way around it. Um, the organization and the outside world has changed faster than the organization can keep up with. And this whole mantra of, well, you signed up, is just stupid. It's just not what the organization is. We I owe agree. it. We owe it. And this is why organizations like yours exist, because when we signed, when I signed my contract over almost a quarter century ago and said, here, Take my backside, stamp property of the U.S. government on it, and there you go. <laughs> um, when I did that, it was it was a different military, and maybe some of that that attitude was more um, prevalent. But still, the changes that have come, organizations like yours exist, and and 
places that I've gone to take care of my injuries, uh, visible and invisible, exist because they didn't hold up their end of the bargain. They thought it was a one-way street and said, well, screw it. You're, when you're done, you're done. We're, we're done with you. No, you owe it. I, I gave you 20 plus years. Now you got to give back to me. Uh, and, and because they're bad at that right now, the pink berets exist, right? Because they're, they're, they're the, the, uh, pick any other one out there that you want, you know, project one vet at a time who came on the show here, uh, you know, any other organization that's out there that helps enrich the lives of veterans and gives them free the shepherd center here in Atlanta, the share military initiative. I mean, you know, all those organizations have grants and they exist to help veterans because the government sucks at it. Yeah. No, I agree 110% with you. And the mindset does have to shift too, because we still do have a lot of that traditional thinking back then of what the military is supposed to be like. And I can tell you, you know, somebody said something to me the other day that, that also made a lot of sense. And they said, you know, you have your top leadership that still thinks that the military is the way that they saw the military when they served. And then you have the leadership that trickles down that sees the military very differently. And not one is the same. They're, they're, they're all not meeting in the middle because one thinks it should be one way. And so they're, they're tugging at the way the military system needs to look. But in the process of that, you know, there's a lot of things that are going awry. Yeah. You know, there's things that aren't being fixed. And so that's why we said there's a huge systematic failure within our own military system. And we need to do something um, do you, to fix that. Do you see and it, women who come through your door who are still serving on active duty? Yes, I mean, and they're still being assaulted. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'm wondering, like, where does that work with you reporting it, or is this just an outlet for them to go through a completely non-related area to the military where they know it'll never get reported? Well, here's the thing: um, you still have those that are in fear of retaliation, right? But yeah. now you have TikTok. And TikTok has allowed people to have this platform to tell their story to protect themselves. And it's a really unfortunate thing when you have a social media platform that people are trying to use to protect themselves because they're still serving. It's still happening. They're still being um, ostracized. Um, they're being threatened. And so what good does reporting do in their mind, right? So they're going to report it to the masses. They're going to report it to the public. They're going to let everybody That's know. So it's so strange. It, it, it seems like Isn't such a it? backward revolution of, of the way things should be. Absolutely, because for me, it's like, okay, now, now people are seeing all the flaws within the military, and that can't be, that can't be good for anybody. Um, and so for us, it's like, okay, we're still identifying that there's an issue. And then you get the Department of Defense report. I don't know if you saw the most recent one, mm -hmm. but it is still the, the percentage of sexual assaults in the military are still on the rise. You know, the percentage is still going up. And so for me, does that mean that people are using their voices more so? Um, and so now you're seeing an increase in that. Yeah, the reporting. Or is it they're reporting? Um, but or is it that it is still happening um, as much as it was before? And if that's it, then, yeah, we still have a huge problem. Yeah. And I, I think what really uncovered the depth of the problem was um, when the Vanessa Guillen um, tragedy took place. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you right now that that to me was a catalyst and everything that people started to really open their eyes to, they thought, wow, this is this is a problem in the military? I don't remember telling me that. Is it really a problem? It's like, are you kidding me? Yes, it's really a problem, right? We're not even scratching the surface when we have this discussion. Um, but then when the internal review took place and they really started to uncover exactly how deep and rooted this problem was, then people started to pay attention. Then people started to say, oh, we need to do something about this. And for me, it's like, well, why now? Women have been fighting for this to change over 20 years, closer to 30 years. Explain to me why, especially in this day and age, it's taken 30 years for people to realize that this was an issue. Um, I, I, I'll ask this. Um, 
Did you ever think in your wildest dreams when you started the Pink Berets that there would be members of your organization testifying on Capitol Hill uh, in front of Congress, helping to alter and change laws on how the military prosecutes military sexual trauma? No, I didn't. I didn't. And I thought that that was um, where we really started to garner hope that this change was coming. And I distinctly remember um, having our social media manager at the time post something that change was coming, that it was inevitable, that regardless of what people wanted to take place, it's out there. And um, we all banded together uh, with this grassroots initiative with other women across the country. And we wrote the policies that you see today in that Vanessa Gideon bill. It was that important for us to be able to um, go to this press conference and put the demands in the hands of the people that are supposed to be making those changes. And I remember people saying, you know, I was against this, but now I'm for this because I didn't know it was as big a problem as it is. And for me, it took a very horrific death of a young soldier for them to realize just how bad this problem was. So no, I mean, to see this happen, you know, years later and to say, listen, since 2015, I've told you all this is a problem. <laughs> Think about it. Since before then, when I served, right, this no. was a problem, Absolutely. right? But you know, and to part vocalize of me, it now. Part of, part of me is angry at the fact that we had to have a bill written um, to have non-military folks have to arbitrate and adjudicate this whole process. Um, and and I, I'm angry and disappointed because it was people at my level who routinely did the wrong thing uh, and never pushed it and never aggressively looked at the facts and never did what was supposed to be done. Um, and it's more that one-way thinking, right? Like that commander down mentality is that one-way thinking that all shit rolls downhill and everybody else just deals with it. That's the contract you sign. No, we're not on a hill anymore. You know, this nope. is this is a flat road. This is a two way street. Um, and uh, in a crazy, weird way, like part of me is sad um, that as a commander, I never got the opportunity to deal with this because I would have never been light about it. And I've made that publicly known in front of my unit. I've stood in front of formations and, you know. I've said routinely that I will, within the limits of my power, I will literally crush you uh, yeah. if any of this goes on in my unit. Don't even think about it. Like I, I, I've even said, I will assume you're guilty until proven otherwise. It, all the facts and all the evidence and all the numbers are out there that says you're probably guilty. Uh, if you're going down this road, it's 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 not a good road. And people can shun that sort of philosophy, and I and I get it and I understand it. But what I wanted to do is make it clear um, from this from the jump that uh, you know. We've said zero tolerance for years, but nobody actually has ever followed through with that. Because if it was zero tolerance, we wouldn't have repeat things going on and on, right? If it was zero right. tolerance, by definition of zero, uh, there wouldn't be any left. Well, th there's plenty left. So that term got thrown around for far too long in the military. But for me, it's more about just setting a tone and a tenor from the beginning that uh, don't mess with me. Uh, I, I absolutely will put, paint you into a corner and put you on the wrong side of this. Because it's just, it, it's such a... It's such a denigrating thing, um, and, and it, it eats the organization alive from the inside out. Uh, and, and moreover than that, it's organization, organizations like yours that we need now because what happens is in that inside-out eating, um, they can't heal with people in the same room or on a routine basis, right? Like, I, I don't want right. to step too much into your lane, but they need to get out for a while and get away from everything before they can understand and start their own healing process uh, and when they come back to whatever unit they go to, again, it's the it's the stunt double, right? It's the body double um, of somebody who's not the soldier, the sailor, the airman that they were before. And, you know, you still have those women. And again, like I said, you know, we get all walks of life in terms of, you know, the experiences and, and um, why they entered the military. You know, what was life, life like for them before they entered? Um, but we still have some women that, don't feel like they're worthy of help. And I, I, I struggle with that because I had someone come to me recently and say, Hey, you know, I told somebody about the pink braids and, and, um, 
they said that they had reached out to you all and they ten- attended one of your equine therapy events, but then, you know, they, they just didn't feel like they could socialize anymore, but they really want to come back, but they just don't feel like they're worthy. And I'm like, what, what is there to feel worthy of, right? If you needed to take a break, because that's what you felt was the, the right thing to do for yourself at that time, then you take a break. I said, we're always going to be here. And we're always going to receive them with open arms and we're always going to have things available for them to try to figure out what it is they need to be better. Um, but that is the issue too, right? Really helping them understand that, you know, we, we created this organization for them. You know, we didn't create this to say, Hey, come in. You want to report someone and go tell on them. We're going to do that. It's more about, listen, we're here for you to find a safe place, safe place to tell your story a safe place to communicate what it is that you need to receive help. Um, We make as many options as possible. You know, we're building an archery uh, team right now um, and a competitive archery team so that we give women the opportunity to, you know, become competitive again and to um, show their strength and to overcome their trauma through sport. And so for me, it's identifying as well, you know, what can we do? Because we're all so different. You know, what can we do to really speak to what it is that they need to move forward? And that's really what this organization aims to do, too, is, you know, educate this, these women on what it is that they can do to help themselves through the process. But also, you know, what it is that they can they can do to help themselves um, thrive. At the end of the day, you know, we're here to help you move forward, not backwards. Um, and nobody's going to shame you. Nobody's going to judge you. I call it a judge-free zone um, because we want we want women to understand, you know, the gravity of the situation, but how we can address it. Um, but we're also starting a men's MST support group because we've had men reach out and ask if there's something that we could do for them. What kind of world do we live in now that we have to have men come forward and say, Listen, I don't know that I can go sit in another room with a bunch of guys and talk about my sexual assault. Do y'all think y'all could put something together for that? We so happen to find a couple of men who are survivors of sexual assault who are going to facilitate that for us. So it only proves that there's still so much work to be done, yeah. um, but it also proves that we have to continue raising our voices. Um, Lucy and I both sit on the Department of the VA's Committee for Prevention of Sexual Assault and Harassment in the VA. Um, I'm now entering um, a committee on the Department of Defense. I'll swear in in August. That does have to do with sexual assault prevention, but in the military. So listen, I'm, I'm working this from a, a multitude of angles in terms of what I need to do to continue ensuring that the change happens. And it's not lip service. It's not sitting around waiting for something to change. It's not hoping a bill will pass. It's saying, okay, we said this needs to happen. You said you would help us happen. When is it going to happen? What are we going to do? And when are we going to instill these changes in the military? So again, you know, I've got the gift of gab marks. I can sit here all day and talk to you about all the things that we can do. But I'll tell you what, the women on our team are, are some powerful women in their own right. And they will not stop at anything to make sure that things change. Um, I don't want to have to continue doing this for the next 20 years and continue saying that there's a number of women crossing our threshold that have been raped. Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope your goal is to put yourself out of a job, right? Like in theory, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. It, it, when, when the pink brace is no longer needed, we, we've we've reached a good spot because it's curtailed enough. Uh, I, I don't listen. I, you're probably not ever going to be able to completely eradicate it. But um, right. that said, you know, you, you get it to a point where it's more manageable, and, and clearly, the military on its own has done a better job where they don't need. Uh, people like you and the organizations like the Pink Berets um, to to do all the work that they should be doing on their own. Um, it's smart, though. I will say this much. I, I think it's smart for them to, the, the VA and the military, to reach out to outside organizations like yours who specialize in this stuff. Because, look, if they could do it well, they would be doing it. it, it 
they, the military doesn't need to go anywhere to look for how to win wars, right? Like they, they have the strategic right. and tactical power to understand how to do that. Um, you know, Correct. but they have learned a lot from other outside organizations that have enhanced the military. And I think that's smart. So uh, they don't need to ask for help in one area, but in this area, they, they, they do need to ask for help and they should. So uh, the website is thepinkberets.org. Um, you can go there, you can donate, you can offer help and support and everything else. And, um, I just, you know, again, I'm, I'm overwhelmed, uh, between yourself and, and you mentioned Lucy Delgadio, who was a previous guest on the show a couple episodes back, a couple of months or so back, whatever it was, um, was powerful with her story and shared it. And, and thankfully for you guys, and I, I say this to everybody, you might not know the name specialist Vanessa Guillen without the pink berets. You just, you, you might never know who that was and, and, what she went through in the awful ordeal and, and her ultimately, uh, you know, her death that uh, could have easily been swept under the rug. Um, you know, it, it, it'll be a Dateline episode at some point. You know, it'll, it, it'll, it'll be a, 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 a true crime podcast at some point. But uh, we don't know that name without your organization. Um, and so thank you for that because it's so important that we all do know uh, Specialist Vanessa Guillen and we don't forget her. Uh, we, we don't forget that her... her and her family's loss, hopefully, is everybody else's benefit. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It has been great to talk to you. Thank you for being uh, open and honest and, and resharing some painful memories of your own. Um, but again, it's all in the name of a great cause uh, and certainly one that uh, is, I hope, continues to grow. So again, thepinkberets.org. Stephanie Gattas, thank you so much for being part of the Hazard Crown. Thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.